Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Hayes. I'm the designate PTL, and uh, I work at Verizon Wireless on the operations team. So today, I'm just going to run through a few hints and tips for how, you, how to run, designate, and production and get, get the best results. So first off, I, I'm going to run through what the major components are, how they fit together, and uh, how, you, how you can use them to get the best results. So this is a slide that's been around for a long time. <laughs> Effectively, the the API is like any standard uh, OpenStack API. It, it, it all it does is semantic validation, make sure there are, make sure your requests are in the right format and <coughs> fits the the overall just basic uh, correctness checks. Where then it goes to Designate Central, which is effectively we've centralized all the business logic and database access into the Designate Central. And again, tr being a traditional OpenStack service, this is all communicated over RabbitMQ. So they get uh, things get stored in the database, and if there's any actual actions to be performed, we kick them out to a pool of worker processes. So the workers are where the real meat is. It's where when you make an update to a zone, if you create a new DNS zone or you delete a zone, uh, the worker is responsible for loading the right backend talking to the DNS server to create or del delete the zone, uh, and making sure that the create actually happens. It's also responsible for sending, whenever you create or update a record, sending a notify to the DNS servers to say, listen, something's changed, you gotta, get, you gotta refresh. Uh, so the backend section there at the top left, they are software plugins. So. We support a large amount of DNS servers at this point. So you can choose in your configuration what DNS servers you want to use, and the worker will load it dynamically each time it needs to talk to the server. Uh, so the customer-facing DNS servers can be something, anything like Bind, PowerDNS, NSD, uh, or it can be services like uh, Dynect, or I think it's just Dyn now, or Akamai or some of the commercial uh, DNS servers like Infoblox. Um, <clears throat> these DNS servers actually, they get the DNS information is sent to them in, well, the DNS standard. So we use zone transfers to send the, the DNS information from designate to the DNS servers. So that's what the mini DNS server is. It's a small, light-ish weight. Uh, DNS server written in Python. Uh, you should, under no circumstances should you expose it on the internet. I did it by accident a couple of weeks ago in one of my test clusters, and it didn't go very well. <laughs> uh, but all it does is literally, it, it, it calls the database, gets a list of all the records, creates a zone transfer uh, dump, and sends it to the DNS servers. Um, and then we have a couple of per periodic tasks. So we have, for example, when you delete a zone, we, we have a task you can enable that. What we do is a soft delete, so we don't actually delete it from the database. So you can say, uh, I want this periodic task to run every 24 hours and just hard delete any zones that are, have been deleted for at least a week or whatever you, whatever you want to set it to. We also have uh, periodic checks. So the producer will, will set up a list of checks and tell the workers, go check this zone to make sure that just everything is consistent. Because we use DNS, making everything eventually consistent is easy because we find the zone isn't in sync because, I don't know, the DNS server was down when, it, when, it, when the update happened or uh, something just gets it a whack. We send a new notify and they get an entire copy of the zone again so it brings it back into sync. So for the tips and tricks, designate's very simple. Um, Everything in our cloud, everything in our project can do active active HA and scale horizontally. As long as we're connected to the same RabbitMQ, the same database, you just boot more. There's one caveat coming more coming in a second, but um, it was designed to just run on one machine and also run in the fleet. Um, 
the uh, the, the only way that this is this is only now if you run the designate producer and worker model. If you're running on the older zone manager or pool manager um, uh, architecture, there's a few other. The uh, pool manager wasn't HA, uh, and neither was zone manager. So it's this is under the new the new architecture that it's part of the reason we moved to it was to allow us to scale out. Right now, uh, the designate producer needs a, a distributed lock manager because one of the really important things that we do with the producer is to sh shard the zones. So if you have three producers, it'll each 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 of them will take a third of the zones as the as their responsibility for when they're generating the lists of periodic tasks that need to be done. And right now, so it needs to be a twos. Uh, supported backend that supports groups and sharding. So right now, that's the list in Zookeeper is most preferred because it's an actual distributed lock manager. Uh, MySQL works. Uh, Redis is actually okay. It's actually pretty good because you can do a HA Redis. Memcache, if you're really desperate, Memcache will work, but yeah, I I, won't, I wouldn't rely on it being uh, HA or up. Um, there's no, there's not a huge issue if it fails. Uh, the designate producer, if it fails, will decide it's the only uh, producer in the group. So it'll actually take responsibility for all of the zones. So it'll produce three times the amount of work and it'll be a third of the speed, but it won't actually break anything. It'll just be really slow. So when you're right now with the database, the only thing that needs write access is designate central. So if you are deploying designate and you want to make sure you have it secured, the only place that needs to actually write is in the central. And the only place that actually needs, there's only two places that need to actually touch the database at all. So if you are interested in, in securing your setup, only putting database credentials at all on those two and making sure that the user on the designate mini DNS config file or node doesn't have write access definitely helps. So as part of that, the mini DNS server is the, is the, is the as I said, it should never be on the internet. Um, so what you should, generally what, when, when, I, when I have it deployed is I have a firewall off and the only thing that can actually talk to it are the, DNS, the other DNS servers that I'm controlling. Or if you're using the likes of Akamai or Dynax, they'll give you a list of IP addresses for their, I think they call them zone ingestion endpoints. But they give you a list, they'll give you a range of IP addresses that you should allow in to talk to mini, to, to mini DNS. And you should use TSIG keys to authenticate any DNS server that's coming in. So. This is an example here. We support creating DNS uh, TSIG keys in our API. So you generate one, create it in our API, um, and make sure you set it to a scope of pool. Uh, there is other scopes, but they're generally not used unless you have very, very weird use cases. And if you have a use case like that, you'll know it. And set it to be scoped to the pool ID. So, for example, with this TSIG key, you then in your bind config will say, this is the key, and when I'm talking to the mini DNS server, use that key. So, before I move on, is there any questions about so far? No? Okay. So, DNS is kind of something that needs to like work always. Um, the easiest solution, if you're really concerned about your data plane, is to use somebody like um, Akamai or Dynect as your edge server providers, because they have mo massive geo-distributed uh, pops that are all anycast and are up a lot more than 
uh, other services. But Designate itself uh, can actually be run in a disaster recovery mode. So this assumes you have a shared keystone, which may be an assumption, but uh, that can be done with a database replication of shared Fernat keys between the two keystones. We'll make sure that it'll continue to work. And then SQL replication for the, DNA, the, the, the database that Designate uses. So if you have just constant shipping bind logs, or the, the, the bin logs from MySQL across to this region, uh, and <coughs> getting it ready, you should probably you should keep uh, Designate Producer shut down when it's in a when it's in standby mode, and you keep the same pools.yaml file because it's, it should be controlling the same DNS servers, because your DNS servers shouldn't be limited to one geographic region. You should be spread out a lot a lot more global than that. So <laughs> then, you know, if it all goes on fire. It's, it's a pretty simple set of solution. Um, you start up Designate Producer. Um, you point the API. You, you, if you have, a, you, you should be using some sort of geo load balancing. You swap the traffic from one region to the other. And uh, we, we have a thing called a threshold percentage, which is what we consider a zone to be active at when it so if you say you have 100 DNS servers, if you set the threshold percentage to be 95, as soon as 95 servers have, that, have, the, new, have the update or the new zone, we consider it active. So this will allow you to, say, to adjust the threshold to exclude servers that are down in the, in the region that's gone. But if you do that, you need to restart the, the worker. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's, because it's such a simple service, and the way we, inter we interact is with the DNS protocol, the servers, the, the, the servers will have the ability to swap over and start reading from the, the recovery zone. <coughs> so I refer to a pools.yaml file. It's, a, it's, how, it's how we configure what we, ha what we call server pools. So we can have groups of DNS servers uh, that are entirely separate. So they have separate namespaces, and so you can have example.com in, 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 in two different pools. And they allow you to do a lot of things. So, if, so for example, there's some people who, wanted, who used Designate who had far too many zones for a single bind server to handle. So if you have three equal, equal pools of servers, you can shard your customers across them and there's, there's schedule, of filters, schedule of filters in Designate that allows you to say, if a request comes in randomly assigned to one of these three or uh, assigned to these two, or unless it has this flag. Uh, and because the, the schedule of filters are all pluggable again, you can write your own if you want to say, look up the amount of uh, zones in a pool and do a weighted distribution. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple, it, it literally it takes a list of pools in, does some stuff, which is entirely up to you, and then passes a list out. You can also use it to group pools by features. So you may have a cheap, free DNS pool that's two servers or two regions. And you may have, <laughs> call that bronze, and you have a gold standard tier, which is spread across 20 different data centers, any cast, and super, super low latency. Um, again, we, we, we support that because we, in the, when you create a zone, you can provide um, zone attributes. So you can say it's just a set of key value pairs, which you can use, which the scheduler can then use to decide it uses as hints to move the zone into the right pool. And you can also use it, say, to restrict who can see what. So you may have an internal company, so this is only accessible inside the data center, inside the company firewall, or even within a particular neutron network, if you decide. And then have varying levels up to, say, a global pool. And again, using the filters. 
schedule creative zones to the right place. And finally, um, reverse DNS is a problem for pretty much everyone. Um, Designate has two ways of dealing with, uh, with reverse DNS records. So there is a Neutron integration that when you create a port or on a Neutron subnet, no, Neutron network, you can attach a DNS domain to the network and a DNS name to the port. And when the port gets created, it can create both the forward, so the normal DNS record and reverse DNS record, which allows you to point reverse, all the reverse DNS zones you have for, for the IPs you have to designate, but be sure that the people, the people don't have access to change other people's reverse DNS. It's restricted to the IP addresses that they actually own in Neutron. We also support a, a PTR record so for floating IPs. So if you don't want to enable that integration and you have a range of floating IPs, we have an API that will allow users to set the pointer record for any floating IPs they own. So it's, it does a list, it looks at what floating IPs this user has and allows them to set the pointer record to whatever they need it to be. And <laughs> between the two of them, it covers out 90% of the use cases for pointer records and lets people, and let, it lets it be self-service because even, even today in some public clouds it's still send an email or fill in, this, fill in this web form. And this, I much prefer an API to a JIRA ticket. Um, and with that, questions? No? Okay. Mm -hmm.